assessment looks like in a consulting standpoint. So what we kind of do as a background is that we're penetration testers and companies hire us to break into them and uh, it's a really great career path and it's like a really great way to kind of get involved in security, it's kind of fun. Uh, so there's, a, <clears throat> there's kind of like a big methodology about it, there's things like, uh, there's kind of like a big flow chart that we'll go over later, uh, but overall it's just kind of like a couple different concepts, like you start with reconnaissance, then you get a foothold, you start gaining more persistence in a network, and then you start compromising sensitive information like social security numbers, something that a real attacker might want, for instance, in like the Capital One breach or Equifax or something like that. That's the interesting data that they want. And so we go into a network and try and compromise it and discover all of that uh, interesting data. And then at the end, we'll give you some resources for all of you new people to kind of get started uh, in this field. So who are we? Uh, we come from a firm called RSM. Uh, we're a tax audit and consulting firm. Uh, it's, I believe, the fifth, uh, fifth largest in the United States. Uh, we're on the consulting branch. Uh, it does honestly a lot of different things. We're a very small facet of it. Uh, there's locations all over. Uh, we're all out of the Des Moines office, but if we're being honest, most of us work remotely anyways. Uh, I interned in the Kansas City office, but there's some testers like all over the place. Uh, it's a pretty big place around the, uh, the country and around the world. There's offices all over, uh, I believe like 126 countries, something like that. Uh, quite a few different places, so you know, if you're itching to go somewhere, uh, you can go pretty much wherever your heart desires. Uh, so, this is about us. Hi, uh, I'm James Kerbo. I'm one of the newest associates to the, the team. Uh, I graduated from the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, I was a member of the Unisec uh, Security Club and Cedar Wood club at UNI. Um, I'm on Hack the Box quite a bit. Uh, I competed in the CDC here a couple years ago, and um, I like to rock climb in my spare time, and that's kind of me on an average day, luckily with a rope on though. Uh, I'm Seth Johnson, uh, ISU grad a few years ago. Um, worked at RSM now over two years, um, and before that worked at another company on their security team, um, and I'm a senior associate. Yeah, well, that's kind of a good one. Then I'm Nick Lasby. Uh, I go by Blurb Dust Online. I'm an associate and an ISU grad and former ISU member. Uh, I'm Ellis. I'm a KU grad. I used to be president of the J Hackers team. That's like uh, KU Ice Age. Uh, and I climb bigger rocks than James, and then I'm basically Nick minus the beard. So, <laughs> uh, so this is like one of the most important slides in this entire thing. Uh, ultimately, everything that we teach and this club will teach you is for informational purposes. Do not use this against something that you do not have explicit written consent to test against. You can go to jail. Pretty important. We have to say this for legal reasons. Alright, Red Team Overview. You know, just insert all your buzzwords. Uh, long story short, it's testing the network uh, or an application in order to find vulnerabilities or and then uh, write exploits for that, or any misconfigurations that are present in the network or in their physical building. Uh, and then it, it requires you to think like an attacker, so like nation states, or uh, specifically for red teams, nation states. Uh, and then uh, your goal is to assess the risk, uh, determine the control gaps, and uh, recommend certain improvements. Uh, so general overview is your reconnaissance. Uh, it says beachhead, but I call that initial foothold, uh, and then expand. And that's uh, and then target the enterprise, which is trying to go for like domain admin, uh, trying to get all of the passwords. Persistence and aggregation has been. You want to be able to come back into that network pretty easily. And then exfiltration maintenance is when you try and exfiltrate exfiltrate some data such as social security numbers or like MRI numbers, if it's possible. Uh, and so we're typically consulting, which means we travel a lot or we work remote. Uh, and it's very nice. And there's tons of different tests. So currently I'm on a web application. Uh, Ellis is on an internal this week. James is doing training stuff this week. Uh, yeah. 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 But there's also like web apps, so like mobile tests, physical tests, so a lot of stuff. Yeah. And it can range anywhere from one week to three months. I think I'm on month two now of my web app. Uh, and very, yeah. Ellis has traveled pretty much every single week so far, and I've traveled like maybe two weeks. I haven't slept in my bed in like a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and communication is a hugely overlooked skill that is required. 
Alright, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what goes into the footprinting and the initial recon and enumeration. So when we meet with the clients, uh, before we do any, tour, any kind of port scanning or even open source intelligence stuff, we'll sit down with them and we'll threat model with the client. We'll fight, figure out kind of where they're the most, uh, where the attack avenues are that make them the most compromisable and then we'll go from there. Then we will start with some open source intelligence. Uh, social media is a gold mine of information. Employees <coughs> love posting things about their company online, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. You can get a lot of good stuff off there, like badges, um, maybe even like domains, things like that. Um, and we do this before we ever start doing active reconnaissance, such as NMAP, MassCan, and kind of scan. So because there's a wide, vast a uh, variety of attack paths depending on what the client has. We don't have enough time um, or money, or the client doesn't have enough money to give us months and months and months to test every possible attack path. So what we'll do is we'll sit down with them and we'll assess, okay, so you've got a web application um, that's exposed to the internet, let's focus on that, whether as um, some other different attack styles. So we'll, it's like working backwards, we'll figure out where they're uh, most uh, compromisable, and then we'll target our attack approach from there to kind of narrow the scope down. And so it really comes down to three basic questions. What's the bad thing that might happen to you? How is it going to happen? And what controls can stop it from happening? So if you've got a web application, web application firewall, secure development life uh, cycle, uh, awareness training for social engineering and fishes, that's huge, that happens a lot. Um, so that's kind of how we approach clients when they're asking for a pen test or a red team engagement. So when we're doing an information gathering and enumeration, Google is your best friend. You can find tons of information through Google Dorks, such as searching for strings and keywords and URLs. You can narrow uh, your Google searches to specific websites and subdomains for the company specifically. Um, it's amazing. You can search by file types, so only return text files, PDFs, Word docs, PowerPoints, things like that. It's amazing. Uh, we'll do uh, DNS enumeration with Whois, um, NSLOOKUP, DIG, um, a whole bunch of internet tools that are available. Um, then we'll move on to active enumeration, so this is when we'll start at mapping, port scanning, mass scanning. Uh, there are some great tools that automate the active recon, such as Sparta and Reconnoiter. Um, would highly recommend. Yeah, so uh, the, the reconnaissance phase is super important because that gives you all the information to start crafting your attacks, and then you start using them targetedly. 99 times out of 10, like 99% of the time, you're not just going to like find some exploit on a website and then get everything through that. You have to use other ways of getting it. And the easiest way for any attacker to get into any network is through stupid people. Uh, ultimately, that's what phishing is. Like, if I send an email to Jack Potter telling him I want to give a presentation to iSage and it's got a malicious PDF in it, uh, and he's interested and clicks that, then I can uh, own his system based on that. And what, uh, how it applies to companies is on places like LinkedIn, uh, any other place, people provide their uh, usernames, they provide email address, things like that, so that I can send targeted phishing emails into that kind of thing. Uh, ultimately, like it says up there, you don't need to just break down the door smashing into something to try and get in. Most people will just let you op just open the door for you. Uh, like uh, phishing stats, uh, phishing stats specifically, I believe like at least generally like 16% of people uh, click on phishing links and actually like uh, can be exploited by those kind of things. And in an actually big com corporate environment, that's really, really big. And then the result of things like that can lead to things like uh, stolen credentials, uh, like a remote shell in general, just kind of a lot of different impacts. Uh, however, the one thing that tends to stop this is multi-factor authentication. Uh, phishing will always happen, that's always going to be a threat, but if your credentials are compromised or something like that, but you have to use a special token or some other passphrase that you must know or some other form of uh, authentication, it's a lot more difficult for us to go in. I was on an external penetration test last week, and even though I compromised a bunch of credentials, I couldn't get in because I didn't have their MFA. And so it's a pretty effective way to stop these kinds of attacks uh, because passwords can be fished, guessed, like obtained from breaches, like there's a lot of different ways to get them done.
Uh, so, ultimately on the initial compromise, let's say the fish worked. What do we have to compromise? Like, what, how are we going to get in? And there's a couple different things. Ultimately, first off, we've got to bypass like firewalls. We have to bypass uh, like perimeter controls, like firewalls, spam filters, uh, any kind of like web filter, something like that. And those things are super important because uh, they're the things that are going to kind of like destroy our phishing attempts. Uh, ultimately, uh, blue teams, defenders, are getting pretty smart, unfortunately for us. Uh, and so they're actually being able to detect these types of things. So these are the things that we want to be able to bypass. Uh, now, if we have bypassed that, what do we need to bypass after it's already got through those? Well, there's more things. This is like antivirus, whitelisting softwares, a bunch of different things that we have to do. Uh, because if you actually get something onto their system, but antivirus picks it up, it's dead. It doesn't matter. Because it's not going to let you like actually execute whatever your payload is. So, how do we bypass these things? There's a lot of different ways to do it, and as soon as we come up with a new way, they come up with another way to detect it. So, it's just kind of a game of cat and mouse, how to go back to it. So, with this example, uh, this was a uh, uh, macro injection, I believe. Uh, something that's like uh, on uh, Microsoft Word documents, like uh, anything like Microsoft Office related, you have macros. And macros can run things at like uh, privilege levels, uh, things that you shouldn't be able to run. And so uh, you can actually inject malicious payloads into those. And so we have a test like uh, Excel document that has these macros enabled with something malicious in it. There's a great site online called VirusTotal that you can upload malware to and detect, and it'll show you how many different antiviruses detected. And so we were testing on this, and 29 <coughs> out of 58 uh, got it, roughly half. So that's just like, uh, there, there's like the code in there, et cetera. But if you make a couple tweaks to it, uh, it's easy to bypass. So if you tweak two different things, renaming a function, that's all it is, renaming it, not changing it, and then changing a string to literally just concatenating something at a different place, it bypasses nine more. So with a little bit more tweaking, not actually changing the payload, just like tweaking small little things, you get down to one antivirus. That's how easy it is. Uh, how many of you guys know what Mimikatz is? All right, most of you. If you don't know it, look it up, great tool. Uh, really, really helpful, especially for us. Uh, but in that tool, uh, Mimikatz is spelled M-I-M-I-Cat. Uh, if you change the second M to an N in the whole thing, almost like, for, for a very long time, most antiviruses wouldn't pick it up. That was all it took to like bypass things. So, uh, now you get to some like more uh, high level kind of things. Uh, ultimately, like when we have something like uh, a macro that we've been able to execute, uh, it's pretty easy to pick up because it doesn't run like an Excel document, like an Excel document. When you open it, it will spawn something like PowerShell to give you uh, credentials or reverse shell, whatever it is. It's not actually spawning like uh, some sort of like Excel reader or something like that. Uh, so it's easy to detect. So how do we get around that? Well, uh, there's a a great little suite of function calls called an API. That's a, an implicit Windows control system that has a lot of things like system calls and just kind of handy little things for developers, but they're also great for us when we're bypassing things. And so you can use those to inject the code directly into processes and do basically whatever you kind of want without launching new things. And so you can bypass those kinds of things. This can also be done in the macro itself. So once you're in, what are you going to do? <clears throat> so you, you go back to your recon. You want to make sure you, you run your port scans again. You're going to find out uh, where all the hosts are, where all the juicy hosts are, like the domain controller, uh, if there's any unpatched systems. And from there on, we need to figure out persistence, uh, maybe privilege escalation, and uh, we might have to pivot depending on the engagement. Uh, so with your initial footbolt, run who am I? It'll tell you like what user you are and what privileges you have with who am I privilege. Uh, so are you standard? Are you privileged? Are you uh, an admin? You can't run memory counts unless you're a local admin. So let's check if we are a local admin. Uh, if we are local admin, uh, let's check if we got lucky and we got domain admin right away. Which we didn't, that's fine. Uh, so one method to gain more credentials from this initial foothold is uh, LLM and R poisoning. So that's link local multicast name resolution poisoning. Uh, it's enabled by default uh, on all domain control on all domain controller installs. 
uh, as well as NetBIOS naming service, NDNS. Uh, and IPv6 is also enabled and preferred by default uh, by Windows. So we can basically just announce to everyone uh, saying, hey, please send me like password hashes. And by default, Windows will basically do that. Uh, so a user has to trigger an event first, such as looking for file server or like file server <coughs> without PR. Uh, and so then we just respond back, hey, we're file serve. Please authenticate with me. And then uh, they authenticate with us. We get their hash. And then we say, hey, sorry, there's an error. Try again later. Uh, and it's great. It gives so many hashes so much of the time. And the tool is Responder, and it's awesome. Uh, so from there, uh, we have more usernames. We crack those passwords uh, that people have authenticated to us with. Um, so persistence. We want to ensure that our initial foothold stays there. So what we can do uh, is we can put in special registry keys in the registry. So that's Windows basically giant configuration file. Uh, and you can just specify, hey, on reboot, we need this process to start back up. Uh, so on reboot of that machine, it'll just send us another reverse show. Uh, one way we like to do that is with scheduled tasks, uh, specifically with the undeletable thing. Uh, you can just create a named pipe and shorten the name uh, to like four characters long. But then in normal Windows land, past the name pipe, you can exceed the NTFS format length. So that so it goes to 254 characters. So if you're browsing a Windows system normally and you try and delete it, it's an invalid file name. So Windows will not delete it. Uh, and because we did the name pipe trick to get it down to four characters, we still can like write to it and we still can access it. And with scheduled tasks, it's basically a cron jobs, but for Windows. And we can schedule like every hour, send us a new shell, and they can't delete the file. That's awesome. Uh, we can also backdoor legitimate applications. Uh, like injecting into Excel or whatnot. Uh, so if you aren't an administrator and you need to escalate, check for missing patches. Uh, one of the great things recently is Deja Blue. Uh, that'll get you right up to system, uh, as well as uh, Blue Keep, which will get you to the kernel, and then you can escalate to system, uh, which is past local administrator. That's, that's the root equivalent of it is. And if there's any insecure services, so Dell is awesome at this. They will send out services that run as an uh, NT authority system, but they will have a space in their name. So we can just inject ourselves basically into that space due to Windows default behavior. Uh, and see if anyone stored like their password on the desktop, saying password.txt. Check that out, see if there's anything there. Uh, and if you do get admin credentials, uh, then you can laterally move to other ones as well using that <laughs> admin credential, assuming it's not change on any other system. Uh, one of the ways that we do this is with Bloodhound. Uh, it can be used <coughs> as a, a standard user, so with that initial shell, you just run Bloodhound, and it'll gather all of the computers in the domain, it'll gather all the users and all the groups, who has admin rights, and where they have admin rights, as well as where the admins are currently logged in. Uh, it'll, it will do all of the graph theory and magic in order to show you the shortest path to full compromise. Uh, but the con is there's a lot of information, so it's really hard to sort through. Also, it's very noisy. Uh, so if anyone's running Wireshark, uh, that's Blue Team, they can detect it really quickly. Uh, and that's what Bloodhound looks like. You can see initial all the way up to domain, and that's the shortest path throughout the entire uh, company. All right, so when you find yourselves with a shell on the internal network, uh, and you've enumerated everything you could on the initial box that you own. Where do you go from there? If you don't have anything that you need or anything that you wanted, if you don't have any critical information such as PII or social security numbers, things like that, you got to move elsewhere. So how are we going to get elsewhere? We can look at the remote, remote command execution. Um, if you can, through a responder, grab some hashes, crack them, pass the hashes, relay them throughout the network, pretending to be somebody else, impersonating like a, an actual authenticated user that's part of the domain. Uh, just kind of sneak your way around. Um, if you get a hold of a privileged account, then you're looking at elevated privilege privileges, which will grant you hopefully additional access to the system, whether it's local admin, domain admin, uh, other user accounts that have elevated privileges that might help you move laterally, things like that. Um, and many services through Microsoft um, and Windows um, Require admin privileges, the service accounts do, so that's why they're such a, a prime target, because they have exactly what we need to get around the place. Um, 
And with administrative access, if you can get a hold of it, where you go from there, you persist, uh, you go straight for NT authority system, which again is like the root equivalent for Windows. Uh, can you dump clear text passwords through from memory using Mimikatz? Uh, can you dump pass hash passwords and crack them offline? Kind of the uh, Windows open. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of demo some of these types of attacks, um, pre-recorded. I'll kind of walk you through what's what's going on here. I'll show you a SMB relay attack where you kind of insert yourself between a user on the domain and some uh, resource that we're requesting and the attempt to grab their hash and then either pass it on impersonating them, crack it, and then move laterally through the domain as that user. machines um, on an ESXi server networked together, a uh, Windows 7 host, a uh, Windows 2016 domain controller, and then my Cali box acting, acting as the attacker. Uh, and on the Windows 7 host, we have an SMB share uh, called Cherby, of course. Uh, and inside the share, you've got some pretty uh, awesome information that attackers are going to look for, like, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so like social security numbers, credit card numbers, domain admin passwords, you know, these are the things that we want, we're looking for, if we find this, you know, it's, it's the jackpot. Um, and then on the domain controller, I'm going to query the resource on this Windows 7 box, um, and while the domain controller is querying that resource, I'm going to have a listener set up. Um, so the dash H flag is the IP address of the Windows 7 box that's running the SMB share. Um, dash E is a word.exe, it's a malicious payload that I set up in case I needed it. I don't think I ended up actually using it on this one, but that is something else you can do. You can send a uh, malicious payload called word.exe because, hey, it's Microsoft Word, what user wouldn't click on Word to get the work done? Um, and then that could just spawn a reverse shell on your, your attacker box if that's the attack path that you All right, so yeah, I've got the listener set up now, waiting for the domain controller to query the Windows 7 machine on the SMB share. And there's the query. I'm going to pause this real quick and point something out. So you'll see on the command prompt output, uh, the system cannot find the path uh, specified. That doesn't immediately send any red flags to anybody, right? If I'm a sysadmin or if I'm on a, the IT staff, if I see that error, I'm going to be like, oh, huh, that's weird. Uh, I'm pretty sure this host is online. I wonder why I can't I can't access the share or I can't query the share. Uh, and so that's that's great because it doesn't immediately send any red flags. It's going to be like, oh crap, somebody's on the network. I need to sound the alarms. And then we can see here on my attacker box, I have the hash of the administrator account on the domain controller itself, which is awesome. That's exactly what we look for. There's some more of the output from the, the script. The script, by the way, is called SMB Relay X. Hi, yep. Uh, and it's part of a tool suite called Impacket, which is awesome. We as testers use Impacket, or at least I do. Uh, I know Dave, our manager, loves Impacket. We use it all the time. It's got a whole bunch of different tools that can do a lot of things that you're going to need on an internal test. So yeah, I'm just kind of highlighting the hash output of the, of the administrator account. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this hash, save it to a file, and now I can get off the domain if I want and just crack the hash offline, which I will do in a minute. There it is in the file so creatively called hash. And I'm going to use John, just because I don't have GPUs running on this speed, um, or yeah, this ESXi server, and there we have it. We have, it might be a little cut off for you, the password is just password123, dollar, dollar, money, right? Uh, and so then I can take that credential or that hash and either pass it throughout the rest of the domain, or I can log in as a the standard user on the box as domain admin, which is uh, awesome. And then I will quickly show you what you can do further from there. You can, one, if you want, you can spawn um, a shell. Oh, oh, oops, there you are, right? Thank you. Oh, sorry, yep. Yeah. So, um, disregard that. I am now going to walk you through a good roasting attack. <laughs> Jump the gun a little bit. Sorry about that. Cool. Okay, 
So I'm going to quick walk you through what curve roasting kind of is. So curve roasting um, is, so there's a protocol, an authentication protocol on Windows and Linux can use this too, called curve roast. And basically, uh, when you want to query a service on the domain, whether it's a file share or a SQL server or whatever, you first have to go to the domain controller and say, hey, I want X resource. That domain controller is then going to do some encryption on something called a ticket, a ticket granting ticket. Um, and then send that off to the service that you're requesting. That service is going to do some more encryption magic with that ticket, send it back to you, make you authorize yourself, or authenticate yourself, sorry, um, saying, oh, hey, you are who you say you are, you have access to this resource, I'm going to grant it to you. What you can do to kind of bypass this authentication mechanism is something called a curve roasting attack, which is where you basically uh, get the ticket, grab it offline, it's, um, if you're lucky, the encryption is going to be weak on the ticket, and it's going to be RC4, um, which is a standard hash, uh, very, very crackable. And then you can crack that offline, grab the, um, the, the password for that service account, and service accounts are great, again, because they typically run with elevated privileges, and then again, you can use that to further your access across the domain. So what I did here, quick, is I ran just a really short NMAP scan, just to kind of see you, give you uh, the open ports are on the box, and you'll see 88 with Kerberos is running, and then 445 with the SOM share, SMB share. Uh, and then I'm going to, oh, by the way, sorry. I spent hours debugging uh, Kerberos uh, clock skew errors. Uh, for some reason, Kerberos, uh, when it reports, another thing that's important about Kerberos is there's a timestamp. Kerberos is very, very complicated. Uh, Kerberos is very time-reliant. You want to be within, I think, MIT specified five minutes of the domain controller. Um, and if you're not, it's not going to authenticate your ticket. I was within like six seconds of the domain controller, my, my system time was, and it still was giving me a clock skew error. So if any of you have run into this and know the way around it, let me know. I would, well, I would appreciate uh, the clarity. So you ran that? Yeah, so I ran in that. Thank you. <laughs> Takes, oops, takes a little bit. There we go. And so I'll note that right here is that clock skew I was talking about. I am 14 minutes ahead of the domain controller. And in order for me to successfully execute this attack, I'm going to need to adjust my system time. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. <coughs> Skip ahead a little bit. There we go. And how I'm going to execute this attack is again through an impacted tool called Get User SPNs, which is a service principal name. It's part of the Kerberos protocol. Um, and all I'm going to do is specify the IP address of the domain controller, um, and then the, um, the domain itself, the domain name, and the, uh, the service account that I'm trying to Kerberos. Um, just trying to grab that hash. And you'll see I got that clock skew error. Again, uh, this whole video just clocks. <laughs> yeah, so I could literally spend two hours explaining clock skew errors and trying to debug them. And it turns somehow, even though I was previously 14 seconds or 14 minutes off, it then set me an hour off so that I had to go back and readjust the, the clock again. This time I should get that ticket back. Yep, <coughs> awesome. You can see there's that hash, it's a perverse hash um, for an administrator account, which is awesome, high privileges already. And then what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to throw this, um, this hash into a file, and then I'm going to crack the hash, um, get the password, and again, I'm going to do that with John over here. Yep. yep, and there is the password, to master 19 so then again, you can use that to authenticate yourself to other services as a privileged account um, in a very kind of um, legitimate way on the domain. It's not to trip any alarms. But another thing you can do with this is get code execution, get a shell back as domain admin. Um, and so what you'll do is you'll run a tool, grabbing the, the password here, uh, you'll run another impacted tool called psexec. Um, and again, you'll just specify the domain and uh, the IP of the domain controller and the user, and voila, you now have an NT authority system on the, on the machine. 
those are just a few ways of how you can actually, once you have initial access, a few ways of elevating your privileges in like internal networks. Yep. So when you get the domain admin, you have the keys to the kingdom. You can do virtually anything you want on the domain. You can create all the users you want, delete all the users you want, create we'll have back doors anywhere you'd like, things like that. Um, a thing I want to highlight though is that uh, getting domain admin is not always the end goal on a pen test. Basically what we're here to do for clients, um, yeah, let me explain for Rose. Uh, what we want to do for clients is explain and demonstrate how an attacker, a real attacker, could get a hold of sensitive information that might be located on the domain, such as HIPAA data, PII data, social security numbers, credit card numbers, things like that. Um, one quick thing, uh, domains uh, have trusts. So when you're on, let's say a, a company's got three domains. One is their standard IT domain where all their users and groups are located. One is for their uh, PCI environment, and then another one is where they hold the data, let's say. PCI is a uh, payment card industry. It's yes. where like credit card information would be stored. Yes, and then HIPAA would be like medical data, so medical records, things like that. If you go to the hospital, that's, that's the kind of data that I'm talking about. Um, if you want to move laterally through domain trust, there are ways that you can do it. Um, trust in Active Directory can go one way, both ways, and then there's a uh, sort of transient trust where let's say domain, you're on domain A and you want to get to domain C. If domain A trusts domain B, then implicitly if you're transient, transients, you've got trust domain C. Um, so if you want to get to that PIA domain or that HIPAA domain where all that sensitive data is, uh, you're going to want to use domain trusts. And again, so we've got um, sensitive data that we want to demonstrate to the clients that, hey, this is how an attacker is going to or could, or here's how I can get domain admin. And then from domain admin, here's how I can get access to your the data, your uh, PCI data. Um, and if we can't show that we are able to get our hands on valuable data, then it's not a successful pen test because we're here to provide value to the clients. And the way we do that is by proving, hey, this is how you're vulnerable. Here's how you fix it. And one thing, you don't always have to do all these complicated, convoluted, or um, pen testing standard attacks. If you get access to a database um, or a backup of a database, um, typically those old treasure troves of information, passwords, usernames, hashes, things like that, uh, uh, misconfigured file shares. So if anybody can access this SMB share uh, anywhere on the domain, and that SMB share has got, uh, let's say, a OneNote notebook full of passwords or other sets of credentials. That's that's really all we need. That's that's how you're vulnerable. We're going to give you some quick resources uh, if you want to get your hands dirty uh, with this stuff in safe and legal environments where you're not going to get into trouble. Uh, that's the best way to learn. Uh, Over the Wire Labs has a great series of war games, varying in uh, difficulty from very beginner. I've never used Linux before. To, uh, I've been doing this a while. Like give me some pretty hard stuff. Uh, under the wire is very similar to over the wire. Over the wire only is for PowerShell. If you don't have any or very little experience on Windows PowerShell, it's a great resource to use, especially Posh Hunter. It's very similar. Only it's a VM, a Windows VM, and there are flags in it that you use to, to get through PowerShell. Volhub, you can download virtual machines uh, to your local machine that are designed to be vulnerable, and that's how you can also get some hands-on um, experience with these tools. Um, and procedures, same with Metasploitable, by Rapid7, people who made Metasploit. Uh, damn vulnerable web app, if you want to get your hands dirty with some web application testing, hands on, that's a great resource. Hack the Box is awesome because you don't have to download VMs manually to your, or locally to your machine. You can access a VPN where all the machines are hosted for you and attack them that way. Um, and then there's the SANS uh, Fast Track, Cyber Fast Track program that is, I think, recent in the last three to five years. Um, Maybe you guys are aware of that. If you're not, definitely check it out. It's a several month program and it starts people off like I've never heard of cybersecurity before to, and it caters to people of all difficulties. Um, we're going to be at the career fair. Um, come see us. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, check us out on SciHire. Um, if you do stop by, mention that you came here. That's yes. That's a good yes. That way we, we know where you're from. And then you guys have any questions?
Uh, just to know, for all can you people who are interested, like at least a little bit interested in this, uh, this is a lot of information, understandably. Like, we've been doing this for a while, this is what we do, this is our profession, but you don't have to be good at everything immediately, you don't have to be a master of, like, a master of all trades immediately. Ultimately, you just have to be curious and willing to just try things out. Even if you're like not very interested in it and you're in a computer profession, trust me, stick with the club. You'll learn a lot and it's very valuable in your future. It's a lot of information, but if you're interested, even reasonably, like all of these people up here, all of us up here, we're more than willing to help you out. It's a lot of information, but it's also a lot of fun. This stuff is just fun. I remember when I first started poking around with this stuff, I was so overwhelmed because there's there's literally so much information where do you like begin to start, right? So if you feel that way, it's totally normal. Just again, like Ellis said, stick with it, ask questions. Everybody just wants to, to learn together and help each other out. And we're here for resources if you have any questions. Everyone in this industry is like weirdly nice. It's kind of weird. Like to the point that you don't know if they're like trying to like fish you or something like that. But yeah, like everyone just like wants to help everyone learn because you know He's smarter than me in some ways. He's smarter than me in some ways. I'm smarter than them in some ways. We're all learning from each other. And like, you know, whether you're going through your first programming class or you're a master of Linux but know nothing about Windows, it, it's just a learning experience across the board. But just be curious, stick with it, have fun. <laughs> all right, actually no, any questions? <laughs> yeah. So when you guys are conducting like a penetration test, I saw some of your nmap scripts were would be considered loud. Oh yeah, very loud. Um, so I don't don't run those. <laughs> <laughs> like, no yeah. Way. So there's a difference between a penetration test and a red team assessment. A penetration test is the loud and proud, knock down the door. I'm gonna find as much as I can in as little time as possible. Enumerate everything. Be really quick. Like Bloodhound, great tool for analysis. But if you're trying to be super stealthy, it's gonna out you immediately. And so you're trying to be stealthy other times. A red team assessment is trying to act like an actor who is targeting this company specifically trying to get confidential information. Like we're going to start on the outside with something only uh, someone on the internet would know. And then we're going to target a fish. And then from that fish we're going to get into the network. From there we're going to move laterally, etc, 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 trying to be as stealthy as possible. The penetration test is like we're going to try and find every vulnerability possible we're just going to automate scripts and just like try and like do as much manual stuff as we possibly can in a short amount of time. You so kind of you can kind of think of it as uh, a pen test that's testing their preventative controls, or the red team is testing their detective controls. Okay. Yep. So. Yep. Any question? Red team, you also get like physical aspects going too. I like physical stuff. <laughs> like they get it. Yes, yeah. Can you please tell us about some of these? So, uh, Jack's already heard this story. Uh, last week, uh, I was on two physical assessments um, in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, the first one was just kind of like breaking into their general corporate office. God, I hate you. <laughs> uh, so, the first one was just walking into the general corporate office. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you just walk in after someone and pretend to swipe your badge and they'll just let you in because people are nice. And like I said, talking about fishing, people are stupid. Uh, so it's very easy to just walk in after someone. After that, I was able to walk around for an hour and a half, like found a number of different things, like uh, ID badges, like couldn't access the file server, unfortunately, but found a bunch of stuff. Uh, after that, uh, the client asked me, uh, oh, did you try and get into the daycare? And I was like, well, what did you just say? Um, apparently they had a daycare that was like right next to the client site that only like one or two people was allowed to have access to other than parents like super locked down didn't know it was in scope so she wanted me to try and break in there and so uh, I walked over there with my laptop in my hand and then I knocked on the door and they're like who are you and I was like sorry I'm an auditor like I just gotta do a wireless test you mind if I walk around and they're like sure so I broke into a daycare. <laughs> was, uh, unfortunately, uh, as soon as I got through, I heard her on the phone with security like, is this person supposed to be here? So I very quickly left because, you know, in most cases, like on a physical test, you're in no danger. You have a letter in your pocket that says, I'm authorized to be here. Don't worry, this is part of a test. But I also knew that if I was going to get shot or tased anywhere, it was going to be in a daycare. Like, that's a place that people 
don't ask questions, like get out. So I left. Uh, so that's like one of the most interesting places that I've broken into, but a uh, number of places elsewhere. That's called a social engineering engagement. It's like you just talk your way in the front door, and then what can you find from there? So yeah, there's all aspects of this. You don't have to be super tech savvy, you can just be a good talker. That's it. It's a fun little field. To reiterate our initial disclaimer again, don't try that. Yeah, don't do that. No. <laughs> Like, yeah. <laughs> well, not at all. Especially they care. That's yes. creepy. Yeah. <laughs> or a courthouse. Or a courthouse. Courthouse, yes. I don't know if any of you heard that, uh, seen that article very recently, like today, that dropped two pen testers broke into the Dallas County Courthouse and then got arrested. And even though they were like, hey, we are authorized to be here, they're like, nope. Now they have to post $50,000 bail. Fun stuff. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Specifically non targeted ones. <laughs> yep. So you mentioned that you guys were looking for internships. Like, what would they do? Same stuff. Same stuff as you guys? Yep. We both interned last summer, and we had the same amount of rights that we have right now. What type of uh, skills and abilities are you looking for in interns? Question. Is that? Um, <laughs> well, uh, if you have built up your own lab and Tested uh, things like Hackbox or Molehub, stuff like that. You used pen testing tools, Metasploit, and Math is a pretty generic one. Um, read about things related to Windows security. If I asked you to do an SMB relay attack, you should be able to know how to kind of navigate that. You don't have to know how to do all of those things immediately. Right. Ultimately, the three biggest things that I would recommend is be curious, be able to learn quickly, and the one thing that we actually noted in here is we're consultants. You need to be able to communicate. Yep. Like yeah. we have to talk to clients, we have to talk to present like presentations, we have to talk. And so good written and verbal communication is huge. Yep. And if you come up to us and talk uh, in the career fair, we'll know immediately. Like that's a pretty big one. Yep. Yeah. Yep, you see, you see, absolutely. Any contests like that? Yep. yep. Anyone else? All right. Uh, well, thank you for having us. Uh, we'll probably stay around here for a little while longer, have some pizza. Uh, feel free to talk to us. Our emails are on there. I don't know if they're getting we'll this. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You guys will get this. Our contact yeah. info's in there. Don't hesitate. Like, yeah. You know, it's a field of curious people, like, we want to help you out. Yep. Yeah, feel free. So, thank you guys. Yeah.